Welcome to Aspen Ignites, Conversations to Build a Better World, a series from the Aspen Institute that brings together thoughtful people with diverse backgrounds and points of view. In this episode, three writers discuss personal storytelling. The Light We Give is Simranjit Singh's book about his spiritual journey. He's also executive director of the Religion and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Javier Zamora is author of Salito, And Kwame Alexander most recently published Why Fathers Cry at Night, a memoir in love poems, recipes, letters, and remembrances. So we are here to talk about memoir. That's right. And I am not the moderator, but you all are looking at me like I'm the moderator. (laughs) We're all moderating, right? We're all moderating, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, The hardest book I've ever written. I've written 39. Man. The hardest one I've ever written, because I wasn't making up stories. I write novels. I was telling my story. So having these kind of conversations are even more challenging, because not only did I write my story down, now I'm talking about it in public. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How did you get there? Why the memoir? I didn't think I was writing a memoir. Huh. I think it had I known I was, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I started off writing a book of love poems. Mm just wanting to understand where I was in my love life, why my relationships were failing, Mm. familial, romantic. Um, And I I turn to poetry when I'm trying to be a little bit more patient with myself to to understand myself. I find it very healing and cathartic. Mm -hmm. So it's my job, but it's also this thing that has transformed me. And so I turn to writing love poems. And before you knew it, the love poems were telling a story. Mm -hmm. And my editor says, you're writing a memoir. (laughs) And I thought, I'm gonna make a lot of money. (laughs) I didn't even think about sort of the emotional turmoil that Mm. I'd go through. I thought about the commercial aspect of writing a memoir versus love poems. Mm. And by that time, you know, by the time I realized what I was doing, the books were in the warehouse. That's so interesting. Mm. Javier, you do poetry too, right? So how did this this memoir come out for you? Um, You know, for me, kind of similar. I had a book of poems that came out in 2017 and the book of poems was about me being born in El Salvador and being undocumented in this country and then the president who was the president gets elected and so I was on tour like giving up conversations and telling people that I was healed and that poetry was the means to healing Mm -hmm. and then I would go back to my hotel and be by myself. And now if you read my memoir, you know that I have trouble with being alone. You know, the title of my memoir is called Solito. And if I could describe the poetry was like the tip of the iceberg. And prose allowed me to take a better control of the story that I wanted to tell and that I hadn't told anybody, not even myself. Um, So in short, the memoir, it takes my nine-year-old perspective that leaves El Salvador uh, 6th of April, 1999. And then eventually I make it to the United States um, on June 10th, 1999. And for seven of those weeks, I wasn't with anybody that I knew. But then the strangers become my family. And that story, um, I think I needed different things in my personal life to change. And then again, even writing poetry for me didn't fix the broken relationships right. and the familiar relationship. For me, it took prose. Because to the poetry is when you, you get to hide behind the metaphor. Yeah. You don't, get, you don't have to face it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the prose, it makes us put it into context, mm-hmm. our lives, mm-hmm. and we come face to face with who we are. That's interesting because I thought I grew up thinking that poetry was nonfiction. And then if you look at it mm. from the court of law, poetry is legally fiction. Right. And prose is not. So that, to me, that disti- distinction was mm. crucial. Uh. You set out to write a memoir. No, not at all. Not at all. Actually, all in the same boat. Not, <laughs> it wasn't poetry for me, but I'm, so I'm a scholar by training. Okay. And um, the reason I became a scholar was, you know, I grew up in Texas. I came up in a family where we were the only kids in all of South Texas who wore turbans. And the, uh, the bigotry we faced, the racism we faced, um, I saw it as ignorance. So I was like, I just want to 
educate people. That's why I got on this track. And um, my idea for writing was I would just provide nonfiction information about who we are, just like mm -hmm. facts, so people could know. And, um, and once I started writing, uh, even in my scholarship, I thought that would solve the problems. Um, and 2016 happens, political discourse changes, but also I start to understand that actually maybe people don't care about facts as much as I thought they would. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe facts don't change people's minds. Maybe they don't make us see each other differently. Um, and that's when I started getting into storytelling. And even then, um, you know, I, I started to tell stories, focus on that instead of on facts alone. Um, but I never intended it for me to, for it to be my story. Like my story didn't feel that interesting. Like I was like, I'm just a normal person. Like who would care right. about what I, what I have to say or what I've gone through. Um, but as I started developing this book and writing, um, my editor just kept coming back to me being like, your story is the vehicle for the message. Like it's not about you. Mm -hmm. and I, I was really uncomfortable with making it about me. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's actually not about you, but your story is what's going to draw people in. That's what people are interested in. They've never heard a story like yours before. Mm -hmm. And then once you bring that forward, then you can bring, bring the message out. I think the beauty of this memoir space is that it's our story, but it is the proof and the evidence and the vehicle that connects us all as human beings. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, you're from San Antonio, right? Yeah. El Salvador. Mm -hmm. I live in Northern Virginia. Like geographically, we're from different places. Culturally, we're from different places. Perhaps, you know, spiritually or religiously, we're from different places. But there's so much similar sort of um, themes in our life. We all yeah. laugh. Hope, yeah. dream, laugh, eat, dance, smile, live, die, just like everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when we write our stories, I think we remind each other of our connectedness. Yeah. Our humanity. Right? Our humanity. Yeah. Actually, I've heard you talk about this, Javier, um, how, the, how the hope for your book was we look at, we look at migrants, undocumented people as inferior, foreign, and so on, but like ultimately we flatten them, right? We say, we don't know about them, but we'll talk about them. Mm. And I mean, one of the things that I got out of reading your book was, oh, now I know someone and I know their story and it's so much more complex and there's so much I can relate to in the way you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're human mm -hmm. in all those ways that you described. Is that something that you were intending to do as you were writing? Or is, is that something that was like an outcome and you were like, oh, that's cool? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned facts and stories. Um, I wanted to be a historian first mm. because I think I needed the facts to understand. And the question why I'm a writer that I'm trying to answer is why am I in this country? How did I get here? Why are my parents here? And I think I agree with you that facts don't matter. We know the facts that immigrants bring, you know, we create jobs. If we move into a neighborhood, the crime rate goes down, but we're hearing something different. Mm. So I think we're in a place where emotions matter. And what is the best vehicle for that? Yeah. It's a story. Mm -hmm. It's the memoir. Yeah. Because now you're right. My, I didn't realize that I was doing this. But now everybody who reads the book knows the face of a little unaccompanied child yeah. from El Salvador. Yeah. They know me. They know the people that helped me survive. Their names were Chino, Patricia, and Carla. You know, and yeah. that matters because now, once you know somebody, I think your capability for empathy increases, but not with facts. Right. You know, which is weird how that happens. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel something similar with, with your writing? I mean, it, w one of the questions that, that I think about a lot is how do, we, how do we reach beyond the choir and like reach people who aren't thinking about people like us and our communities otherwise. Sure. Then also think about people who are within the choir, right? people who would care, but just haven't had the chance to. Like as you're writing, who are the audiences? Who are you trying to reach through, your, through telling your own story? You know, I think I am trying to write books that remind black people that we matter. Mm -hmm. You know, that we are not defined by this deficit language other 
marginalized, disadvantaged. Yeah. I try to remi- I try to write to remind black people that of our own humanity because we forget it. Mm-hmm. We're constantly being told we're not. Mm-hmm. Right. And I try to write write books for everyone else to to en- enhance their imagination. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. To give to give them the capacity to be able to think beyond Mm -hmm. whatever limited prejudices and, you know, ideas that have been ingrained in their minds in schooling and at home throughout their lives. I want to change that narrative. After they read your book, it's going to be hard for them to sort of look at you in the way they looked at you, perhaps before before they read it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Hardest thing um, about writing the book. What was? It, I mean, there are a lot of hard things. Yeah, a lot of hard but things. But just yeah. give us. Let's, let's all do one. Man, there are so many hard things. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Um, I'll, I'll go first, just to give you all time, because I okay, put cool. put us on the spot. Um, I got advanced copies of the book in February of this year. It was the first time I had read the book through and through as a memoir because, mm-hmm. again, it started as love poems. The next couple of nights, I had panic attacks. I called my editor. I said, we cannot publish this book. Mm-hmm. I am putting too much of my own self out into mm-hmm. the world. I cannot do this. And, you know, first she told me, well, the books are in the warehouse, so it's kind of too late, but that, that <laughs> ship has sailed. Yeah. And then she sort of talked me off a ledge. But it was... It was very difficult for me to wrap my head around the fact that I was now about to transition from having written 38 books for children mm. to having written a book that has a line in it <laughs> that says, I found my way to your lips in the near dark and let my tongue travel so far into the <laughs> tunnel of your mouth that I could taste your heart. Freeing you from your impervious sports bra, the bright brown nipples, point like, dude. <laughs> I started thinking all middle school teachers are yeah. gonna ban all ben of my bucks, books from classes. Mm. And then I was on tour, and this woman came up to me. She's a librarian, and she said, "No, in fact, I'm buying more of your books mm. yeah. because you are so open, and I feel like I know you yeah. in a way that I didn't. I want my kids to be that raw, that authentic, that vulnerable in their storytelling, in their lives." Mm. So it was really difficult to realize just overall that I had done this and I was going to be out into the world. Mm. Yeah. I'll share, I'll share something similar. And I, and I think a lot of this for me is, um, it's how I grew up in this country. It's racialized, it's socialized, but I care a lot about what people think about me. Right. And I think it has, I mean, part of it's a survival instinct, right? Sure. Like if I get on an airplane, I try to smile so people aren't scared of me. Um, but writing this book, like one of the things I was really trying to balance was how do I tell my story in a way that feels authentic to me and what I'm trying to communicate, but also how do I tell a story that will be something that people can receive and that they'd be open to. Mm. And, um, and that balance of how, how, do you, how do you care the right amount about what people think about you um, without comporting or contorting or changing who you are, that was, that was really tough for me. And there, there are moments throughout the editing process where mm-hmm. I was like, no, I don't want to say that. Like yeah. there, there are things where I'm like, let's just cut this entire section because it, it doesn't come off right or it doesn't right. won't get received right even if I intend it that way. So that was, that was a tough mm-hmm. one for me. I mean, because it's, me. it's also a business. Like yeah. this is, we're writing books, but we're publishing. <laughs> yeah. So it's this idea yeah. of our audience yeah. and how much do we sort of tailor and craft our own writing to make sure that we're going to sell books. Yep. I mean, because ultimately yeah, yeah. that's what we want to do. Mm. For me, I think we're talking about finality. You know, for me, I didn't know that I yeah. couldn't edit the book anymore. It, for me, it was before I got the, after I got the copies. It was reading the audiobook. You know, I read the audiobook, I think, three weeks before the book uh, was on the market. And reading it, I think writing, I cried in some parts. Mm-hmm. editing I cried in another and reading the whole thing I was surprised I even surprised myself of the parts that moved me yeah. in the reading the 20 hours that it took me to be <laughs> in the studio right um and 
after that, I had a, a panic attack. You know, I meet with my therapist every Wednesday in the book, The Memoir Wouldn't Exist Without Her. And what she advised, which is what I didn't do with my poetry, is that I wanted people to care. I wanted people to care about this little kid, mm -hmm. this little mm -hmm. boy, meaning me. I wanted them to see me for who I was. But then the metaphor that she used was that your book is like that kid and you're putting him in a subway station. You don't know where the subway is going. You might know that it's the A train, but that kid might get off yeah. at any of yeah. those like 50 it's stops. Any stop. yeah, yeah. And you can't control it. Wow. And that has to be okay. You know, we are selling books, but not really. You know, you have to be okay with how you see your product Absolutely. or your story. You got you to gotta be the first love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I don't know, for me, that, that metaphor really unlocked a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, like giving up control a little yeah. bit. You know, somebody asked me once, they said, how did you choose what stories to share? Because, I mean, your life is so much more than what's in your memoir. Sure. And I hadn't thought about that before, and I reflected on it for a minute, and I realized I just pick the moments where I messed up the worst in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, let me tell you those stories and then tell you how I went through them. And I was like, yeah, that's such a, at least for me, a beautiful way to live where you're like, this is imperfection as humanity. And then it, for me, it helps me with that finality piece mm -hmm. that like I'm constantly evolving. This book is not a, you know, a wrap up of my life and, and all the answers I have for the world. It's right. just, this is where I am right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. When my mother, my mother passing away six years ago was the beginning of me on this journey to write mm. this book. And throughout my writerly life, she had said, you never write poems about me. You always write about your dad and, <laughs> and, and, and your girlfriends. And I said, mom, we write about the things that bring us grief. Mm, yeah. You never gave me any grief. <laughs> and of course she passed away yeah. and I write a whole book yeah. about me trying to, to love again. Mm. So. Yeah, no, that's great. Would you read us? Would you read us a passage from your book? Do you have something picked out for, for us? Mom. <laughs> <Okay>. So, <laughs> my first book signing for a, a novel was in 2013, and I was on stage trying to figure out what to read, and I finally found a, a something on page 40 and started reading from that. And my friend afterwards, she was like, "What took you so long?" I said, "I had to find something to read." She said, well, "Why didn't you read from the first page?" I was like, I didn't think that worked. She said, if you can't read from the first page, mm. it shouldn't be in the book. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. read you the first paragraph. All right, there we go. Let's go. I was two. It was my birthday. She gave me wooden blocks in all shapes for me to fit in a wooden box, a puzzle of sorts. She showed me how to do it once, maybe twice, and then said with a smile, now you figure it out, son. I said, okay, mommy. It took a while, but I did. And of course, I wanted to do it again and again. And she sat right there while I did, hugging me, wiping chocolate ice cream from my lips, telling me to be careful not to get any on my favorite black and white dashiki. At some point, she got up because she had to go to work or cook or have a life. And I was mad and sad and unsure again. But her job was done. I'd figured that puzzle out enough times to do it by myself. And she knew that. Still, it wasn't as much fun without her, and it wasn't the same kind of happy, but I felt loved because she was there, and that gave me strength to carry on. Hmm. Hmm. It's beautiful. It's yeah. Beautiful. Is that your Thank first you. memory? That's my first memory. Yeah. Yeah. You must be a writer. <laughs> That's my, so I started the book, which is a good question, a craft question, because we should yeah. probably get one of those in before we leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we start and how do we end? Yeah. I started with my first memory of my mother, mm and I ended in her hospital room, mm. you know, mm. holding her hand, yeah. asking her to squeeze it if she wanted me to take her home because she was on a ventilator and had had a stroke. Mm. So I started at the beginning, that first memory, and I ended with my last. Mm. Oh. Man, well, you know, I, I read a lot when I was writing the, the memoir that your first memory tells you a lot about you and relationships right. and just for me listening to about that you really there's love there and well and, you know uh, also that's a good I mean, thanks for sharing that yeah. because something you said earlier mm -hmm. i don't like to be alone yeah mm. and that was sort of that first instance she was gonna leave me mm. to figure this out on my own and i didn't want her to go mm -hmm. and i think that may have been you know my therapist would probably say that's where it started <laughs> yeah 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 
tell us, tell us how, how did you start your memoir? Oh, God. Um, I didn't include my first memory. My first memory is my third birthday. And now I'm with my mom as well. And then it, I think it, was, it explains a lot about me. Right. Um, because she does leave when I'm five years old. Mm. Um, and so I knew that there's a lot of thoughts about parents who, how could you send your kid? Mm. How could you bring him to the United States? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was important that people realize that what parent doesn't want to be with their child and what child doesn't want to be with their parent. And because of that, I didn't want people to necessarily judge my mom and my dad. So I begin a few, uh, like a week before the day that I leave. And then that gave me kind of like the rubric, the calendar mm -hmm. that I needed to fill. And then I end it when I'm reunited with them. But I don't describe them. The book ends, I'm not ruining everything. Like I make right. it, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, it ends with them opening the door and their shadows. Mm. And then that's it. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that final scene in your book and being like, okay, this is, this is it. Like, yeah. it, it's done. Like, the journey, the journey's done. The journey. Right, even though, even though Another one begins, done. but that one's exactly. done. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, mine is, um, I, I knew that I wanted to start with, an, with a story of an experience that I had that people wouldn't know otherwise, either through their own experience or hadn't heard. And so I, I share the story of the first time someone called me a terrorist. Hmm. Um, and that's when I was 10 years old. And, um, and the story is not actually about this person. It's about my, um, my response or my lack of response. I didn't know what to do. Uh, he was a soccer ref and he wanted to pat down my turban for bombs. And I, I let him and I was so mad at myself afterwards. And so the, the book in a way is a journey of me and my life trying to figure out how I wanted to deal with these moments. Um, and and that, that felt pretty natural to me, that story. Um, what I didn't know was how to end the book. Like, what was the story? And as I was closing out the writing process, I had this moment with my daughters putting them to bed. Um, and they were babies, and, and they were, my older one asked, um, she said, do you ever get tired of taking care of us? Mm. And I, like, had no idea how to respond. <laughs> like, what kind of question is that from right. a three-year-old? And, um, and I remembered this line from my tradition that, that, that I've tried to live by, which is essentially saying, all our lives we take and take and take. Um, but what if we give and give and give and how different that would be? And to me, that's like a project of love. Mm -hmm. And like that defines my parenting, but it defines these relationships. And you, know, you start your story with your book with a story about love. And I think that to me has been the answer. So it felt like a really natural, it took me a long time to figure it out, mm -hmm. but it felt like a really natural closing. Yeah. I feel like this is a natural closing for us too. <laughs> like this. This whole conversation can be described as a project of love. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I just want y'all to know, like, what, what we have been through. Our stories are different, but what we have been through, we're still here. Mm -hmm. And I see you. I, 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 I don't even know y'all. <laughs> I know I'm gonna read your books, mm -hmm. but I feel closer to myself just ha being able to sit here and listen yeah. and, and engage with you all. And I, you know, I, I'm on this journey to become a better man. And I feel like each moment, each second, each day, this right here has helped me. And I just want to thank you. Yeah. Same, same, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it.